Buongiorno Marta, come stai? Buongiorno, bene, bene, grazie. Lei come va? Bene, bene, grazie. Ottimo. Professor Mancuso. Carissimo Giorgio, che piacere. Buon... Pia... Piacere mio, piacere mio. Come stai? Piuttosto bene, grazie. Tu? Ah, insomma, abbastanza bene, non ci lamentiamo. Eh, dai, dai. Via. C'è da tenere duro ancora un po' e poi si torna ai... alla nostra bella vita di viaggi, convegni, bevute. Speriamo. Non Speriamo. Non la vedo così semplice, ma... Lo spero. Ma tu settembre-ottobre sei in Giappone? E guarda, il mio futuro è molto incerto perché come sai il Giappone persegue una politica isolazionista non dura come quella australiana ma mh, abbastanza rigida. Il piano vaccinale è molto indietro sì. e quindi chi lo sa? Ho capito, ho capito. Bene. Beh, io perché io te lo, te lo chiedevo perché io forse, di, ovviamente anche lì dipende dalla politica che verrà, viene adottata, ma conterei se si potrà tornare a viaggiare di eh, andare a Macao eh, verso la metà di settembre. Mm, eh, ho capito. Sei lì da quelle parti un'allungatina un, un la si può fare. Ah, okay. Sono io, sono io che... Ho capito. Sono io che, sono io che faccio casino, no? Mi è arrivata una telefonata mentre... No, oh, no, figurati, figurati. Eh, guarda, non lo so, perché poi qua... Oh, ecco che arriva anche il professor Castellucci, il nostro dominus della sessione. Vabbè. Gli lascio, la, gli lascio la parola a questo punto. Però deve mettere l'audio, se no non lo sentiamo. Pensavo vi bastasse vedermi con la giacca. Ecco. <ride> bene. Bene, bene. Dunque, dunque, noi abbiamo avuto un problema... Parlo in italiano perché siamo ancora pochi, ma vediamo chi c'è. Per adesso siamo solo italiani, siamo da, solo quanto, italiani. Da, da quanto i nomi suggeriscono almeno. Sì, Poi sì. Non so se... eh, eh, sì. sì, sì, lo siamo, lo siamo tutti. E... C'era una, una parlatrice che ha avuto un problema di salute e quindi con ogni probabilità non parteciperà ed è Chiara Correndo, che aveva una relazione interessante su, sull'India e c'è Marina Vahabava che dovrebbe arrivare da un momento all'altro. Quindi, insomma, eh, cerchiamo di fare, no, eh, anche se saremo solo tre, cerchiamo di tenere i tempi, che è la cosa più importante. Quindi facciamo 20 minuti veramente massimo, se ne fate 18 ovviamente, meglio perché c'è più tempo poi per, per discutere fra noi, in modo che finiamo esattamente alle 11.45 come previsto. Quindi se non avete esigenze particolari seguire l'ordine del programma quindi Giorgio Gian Matteo e Marina poi se appare Chiara correndo Chiara parlerà no se appare correndo nel senso se appare correndo è il cognome eh, quindi viene e in quel caso parlerà per seconda o quando apparirà insomma eh, se avete delle presentazioni Tenetele aperte già da ora, in modo che poi fate share screen e le, e le presentate. Chiudete qualunque altra cosa, perché succede, succede di aprire cose sbagliate. E quindi, eh, 
è meglio di no. Uh, dunque. Eh, faccio una, facciamo magari... L'audio si sente bene? Eh? L'audio si sente bene. Le... Facciamo una prova a microfoni a rotazione. Vai, Giorgio, di qualunque cosa. Prova. Fantastico. Ciao, Matteo. Mi sentite? Benissimo. Perfetto. Uh, Chiara non c'è ancora, Marina non c'è ancora. E ovviamente facciamo in modo che chi non parla eh, tiene il microfono spento. Certo. Eh, fate caso. Faccio anche una questo. prova di condi condivisione, vedere se è tutto sì, a posto. Sì, 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 facciamo una prova, dai. Ecco, infatti, uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Allora, 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 io lo devo trovare. Lo diciamo. Perché io la... Aspetta, forse faccio io. Mi, fallo tu perché mi si è aperto in un, in un layout diverso al solito, con tutte le... Sì, prova così, Giorgio. Sì. Un attimo, adesso sembra funzionare. Vedete la mia presentazione? Vediamo, sì, eccola adesso. Perfetto, vediamo. ottimo, grazie. Mi ha fatto bene a farlo a prova. Sì. Gian Matteo, vuole, vuoi provare anche tu? Provo. Aspetta un momento. Vediamo così dovresti andare bene. Sì, allora. Eccolo qui. Si vede? Sta arrivando. Perfetto. 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 Salvatore, una cosa, tu mi vedi come amministratore? Sì, credo, sì, perché dovresti essere come amministratore. Sì, sì, adesso mi vedo anch'io come amministratore, vedi. Quindi siamo abbastanza tutti pronti. Salvatore, scusa, ma tu per abilitare Gian Matteo e Giorgio, da, dove l'hai... Allora, se tu, dove vai, vedi il se tu metti la manina sulla persona sì. ehm, e ti spunta e un, disattiva l'audio oppure tre puntini. Se vai sui tre puntini, gli, gli spunta assegna uh, coorganizzatore. Nel momento in cui tu assegni la persona coorganizzatore, la persona può condividere lo schermo. Eh, perché a me infatti è chiaro, però invece io su ogni partecipante ho il microfono, ho, lo, ho la camera. Sì, ma ci devi portare la freccina o la manina. Sì, certo, poco. però non mi dà, dà l'opzione attribuisci le funzioni di go. È perché l'ho già data io, quindi non gliela puoi riattribuire. Vediamo, ne prendo un'altra chance. Eh no, invece non mi, li, non mi dà questa opzione. Tu vai su, per esempio, su Pasquale, Marta, Lucia. Se io vado su, ecco, uno a caso, esatto. Dovresti, clicchi sui puntini e dovresti... Non ho, i puntini, non ho i puntini, Salve, buongiorno, sono Pasquale. Volevo... Pasquale buongiorno. Dire. Buongiorno, salve. No, io già posso condividere lo schermo anche se non sono uno speaker. Perché tu sei coorganizzatore in un altro pa nel panel, nel tuo panel. Sì, esatto, sì. Sì. Eh, no, non attivo la videocamera perché sono ancora nomade come l'altra volta la riunione dell volta. grazie per, grazie per l'email Pasquale non ti ho ancora risposto ma ti rispondo in giornata eccomi sì, ecco, ecco <ride> ciao Pasquale è che io nella mia versione di Zoom non vedo i tre pallini quindi no, non ho questa bene, vuol dire che c'è un computer scrauso che ti devo no dire. no è una bestia nuovissima bello eh, Poi, cosa ti appare mettendo la, la, il cursore sul nome? Mi appare un menu a tendina che include dovrebbe apparire in alto alcune su cose, tempo. ma uh, non... mi dà una serie di opzioni, no? Quindi mute, unmute, permetti di unmute, di rename ah. e permet... è uno start video, che è l'unica opzione che potrebbe avere un, un senso. Adesso abbiamo un'abbondanza di co-host, nel caso ti possiamo aiutare con le cose tecniche. Sì, no, ma vorrei capire comunque come, come risolverlo con quest'altra versione, perché, certo. perché altrimenti siamo... abbiamo una difficoltà. Intanto mi apro un file di Word per registrare anche la chat. Si, si ha, sappia, siete tutti registrati, le sessioni sono registrate e verranno salvati in un file di Word anche i contenuti della chat. Questo ci può servire sia perché eh, 
non ho capito. Nella discussione escono cose interessanti e quindi le, le teniamo appuntate sia per, per mille ragioni organizzative o logistiche per cui ci può servire di tenere eh, traccia di quello che accade. Eh, Lucia dice posso fare una prova di condivisione? Aspetta, certo, no, certo. Aspetta, ti conviene, non è la tua sessione. Ma... sessione. Lucia, la facciamo nella, sua, nella tua sessione. La condivisione nella tua sessione. Se vuoi fare una prova video e microfono per, per, per la discussione, senz'altro sì. E altrimenti... Il schermo se no diventa un, troppo, troppo... Se no si complica molto e si, si sovraccarica questa stanza. Ti okay. sento lontanissimo, Lucia. We have uh, Celia. Buongiorno, Celia. Anche io vi sento molto lontani, eh? Oh, yeah. Però ho il microfono. Noi ci sentiamo tutti con una certa normalità, Lucia. Con, insomma, se parli un po' vicino, un po' forte, ti, ti ascoltiamo. Io ti condivido. Sono, sono quasi dormendo, perché la stanotte non ho dormito niente. Eh. Non mi sono, sapere. Mi sono, sono, sto ancora dormendo allora, allora ragazzi eh, va bene abbiamo fatto le prove tutto a posto bene, adesso è tutto in ordine quindi we still have one minute before we start oh we get the possibility and so we already have 11 participants here uh... including three, four co-hosts, so we could, okay. Well, 10.15, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, fun to arrange uh, such a big event online, uh, a number of technical issues, but we will, we will manage, no doubt, it will be great. And uh, I open this session uh, quickly Uh, my name is Ignazio Castellucci. I am Professor of Comparative Law at the University of Teramo, Vice President of Juris Diversitas. And uh, we are opening uh, this conference with this panel 1A, titled Dark Aspects in Selected Asian Legal System. The focus is on Asia. We have four speakers in the program. Uh, Giorgio Colombo from the University of Nagoya. He's an associate professor of comparative law and at Nagoya Postgraduate School of Law. He's also the student professor at Ca Foscari in Venezia. And uh, he's a well-known scholar, uh, an expert of Japanese law and researching, teaching, lecturing globally, basically on Japanese law, especially on Japanese law. Uh, another, the second speaker in the program is Chiara Correndo. She may or may not appear due to health uh, problems this morning. Uh, we hope we'll see her and she, is, she will present, she's a researcher from the University of Torino and she will, should present uh, a, a paper on, on the Indian law and Indian legal pluralism. The third speaker in the list is Gian Matteo Sabatino. Uh, he's a PhD from Trento, and he's a researcher at the Chongnan University of Economy and Law at Wuhan, the People's Republic of China. He will speak about the Asian uh, traditional notion of law and how this combines with rule of law and uh, the other very Chinese notion of rule of virtue in, in governing society. Uh, the fourth speaker is Marina Vahabava. She's a lawyer from uh, Avezzano, Abruzzo, Italy, and she's a PhD candidate at Teramo. She will present a paper on Soviet law, Soviet criminal law, in, with respect to vagrancy, parasitism, and all other forms of socially unacceptable behavior in the Soviet era. So it's, it's, a, it's Asia. We have Japan, we have China and East Asia. We have India, perhaps. 
we have the Soviet Union, which is not technically speaking Asia, but is not non-Asia either. Uh, it's it's uh, certainly four different experiences where the law has a thick societal dimension uh, and an important role traditionally as a tool of governance. So there could be a red line, there is a red line connecting the four panels. And so without losing much time, I'll give the floor to Giorgio Colombo, Associate Professor of uh, Comparative Law at Nagoya, presenting his paper titled The Law Be Damned, Hamar Shiro and the Problem of Legal Injustice in Modern Japan. Uh, Giorgio, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, let me share my screen, if possible. Um, do you see my slides? Okay, so um, thank you very much, Ignazio, for your very kind introduction. Um, I'm Giorgio Colombo, and I'm, uh, I am professor of law at Nagoya University Graduate School of Law. Um, between my application and this conference, I was promoted, and I, I give the merit to the Juris Diversitas good luck um, charm. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I wish we could be all in the same room, also because on screen I tend to look like and speak like a news announcer from some dictatorship, but I will try to do my best to be as entertaining as I can. And the topic I decided to, to um, present today is a topic about law and literature, uh, focusing specifically on one selected author, which is Hamao Shiro. Uh, but uh, I would like, if possible, to draw some broader um, consideration and conclusions about law and literature outside the Western context, and specifically in the Japanese context. Uh, now, I would like to start, because I know time is limited. I will occasionally look at my phone. I promise I'm not playing Candy Crush. I'm just keeping time. So um, this is a very Japanese way to proceed you explain the structure of your presentation. And the first slide is the structure of your presentation. So this is the structure of my presentation. Um, I will first introduce these um, famous writer. Unfortunately, he's not as famous as he should be, Hamao Shiro and his life. Um, and how his work is very significant uh, in the development of Japanese law post Meiji reform, when Japan adopted a continental uh, inspired legal system. And I will focus specifically on three short stories, which I find very enlightening of Hamao Shiro work and his significance. The execution of Tenichibo, the devil's disciple, and did he kill them? Uh, from these stories, I will try to uh, elaborate on the concept of law, literature, and the Japanese context. And in particular, I would like to highlight how modern, how contemporary even Hamao Shiro work is. And finally, I will try to draw some inconclusive conclusions because I know that the contest is right. I'm preaching to the converts. Everybody here is a big fan of interdisciplinary research. So I hope I could find um, some um, some, some colleagues interested in pursuing further research. So this is Hamao Shiro, uh, Viscount Hamao Shiro. Unfortunately, he passed away very young because he was very fragile of health, uh, but he's a very important figure in both Japanese law and literature. Um, he was the heir of two of, most, of the most powerful Japanese families of the Meiji period because he was born into a very important family. His father was a court physician and his grandfather was the president of the Imperial University of Tokyo, what is now is Tokyo University. Uh, but he was adopted into another equally powerful family. Um, his adoptive father was the former minister of education. So he was quintessentially elite. And Hamao Shiro, played an important role in the, Japan, in the modernization of the Japanese system because he was one of the first 
Japanese public prosecutors trained under the new French Inspire system. Uh, the Kensatsukan was originally modeled after um, the Minister Public, and then the reform made it closer to the German prosecutor. But he is uh, one of the first legal professionals in this modern Japan. He resigned uh, to the horror of, of his family in 1928 to pursue a career as a, mostly as a novelist, but also as a private practitioner. And he entered the House of Peers in 1933. Unfortunately, he passed away only two years afterwards. Um, and he was also very uh, ahead of his time as a criminologist. His writing on criminal theories in general are surprisingly modern. He was one of the first advocates of non cisgender people right, to use a contemporary lexicon. He was the, one of the first to advocate for homosexual rights, for example. Um, so this is his legal significance, but his literary significance is also is as important, probably even more important. He is considered by many the founding father of the Japanese legal detective fiction, or Horitsu Teki Tante Shosetsu. And his production is mostly set in this very quirky, very fascinating literary stream known as Eroguru Nansansu, erotic, grotesque, and nonsense. Um, other famous authors are like Edogawa Rampo or other. Um, Japanese novelists inspired by Edgar Allan Poe, Lovecraft, and famous uh, writers from the United States and Europe. His recurring topic, and this is what is most significant for today's presentation, is the inability of the legal system to deliver justice. Um, so the contrast between a legal system and uh, something capable of making justice. And this is particularly significant because during the Meiji period, Japan had undergone a very important uh, modernization, which covered all the fields, industry, fashion, military, but also law. And of course, we as lawyers, we tend to think that law is the most important thing, but of course it was not. Uh, Japan became a respected international power when they were able to defeat first China and then the Russian empire. But law had a very important significant, uh, sorry, symbolic significance. Uh, to use the words of a Japanese procedural law scholar, Takeshi Kojima, law was seen as the barometer of modernization. In other words, especially the Western observers evaluated how modern Japan was becoming, looking at its legal system. And the adoption of laws inspired by the continental tradition was seen as the best way to rapidly modernize the country. Um, in this process, law itself, the notion of law in a Western way, in terms of codifications, due process, uh, nullum crimen sine lege, and all these uh, elements became a very synonym to civilization and enlightenment. The law was seen, or at least it was portrayed by the ruling elite as something uniconically positive. And the trust in the legal system was announced. However, Hamao Shiro is a very fierce critic of the legal system. And he mercilessly exposes the shortcoming of the legal process and underlines how the concept of law and legal and justice and just may diverge and more often than not, they do. He is particularly effective in this extremely fierce criticism of the legal system because he has both the knowledge of an insider and the talent of a great artist. And he insists particularly on three points, which are still critical points in the Japanese contemporary legal system. Confessions, interrogations, and the role of lawyers. Moving to the first of the three novels, which is 
probably the least interesting because it's not set in a contemporary setting, but it's set in the past. The execution of Ten Ichibo in Japanese, Korosareta Ten Ichibo. Um, we see this is a parody of some um, stories written about uh, amazing magistrate of the Tokugawa period, Oka Tadasuke. Uh, Oka Tadasuke is kind of like um, a Solomon of pre-modern Japan, somebody who was considered uh, quintessentially just and equitable. And what uh, Hamao Shiro does is taking this image of Justin and deconstructing them. For example, in the novel, there is something similar to the Solomon judgment. Two mothers are fighting over the maternity of a child, and the judge orders them to pull as hard as they can. And then one of the mothers just say, no, I can't do that. I'm hurting the child. And the judge says, oh, you're, you're the mother. You're the good mother. Uh, but in the story, the real mother is the other. And she complains, it's like, I was just following the law. I was following what the judge told me to do. I put my trust in the legal system and I was deceived. Um, the story is about um, this person who claims to be a noble, basically. But if the claim was to be accepted, that would create a lot of political disturbance. And so the judge wonders what to do. And eventually, he decides that it doesn't need to carry out any investigation or to find the truth, because the truth is whatever the judge says. The legal process is so strong that it can disregard reality. And this short story is a satire against the repression of popular protest that was ongoing in Japan in 1929. Hamao Shiro shown how law can be used instrumentally as a weapon to suppress dissent. However, the two most important short stories I would like to deal with today are The Devil Disciple, uh, Akuma no Deshi, and uh, did he kill them? Karega Koroshitaka. And I think those are most significant because they're set in a contemporary period than Hamao's life. Akuma no Deshi is the diary of a person who has been sentenced to death for a crime he did not commit. But not because he was a nice person or an innocent person. It's because he wanted to commit another crime and failed. And uh, is in the form of a letter this person is writing to this extremely evil individual, um, the devil of the title. And the whole plot revolves about the uh, fact that law is only capable of punishing somebody who is guilty of a crime, but not somebody who is inherently evil. We can see from sentences like, at the same time, I cannot help being appalled at the frailty of the laws of distinction that are powerless to stop someone as dangerous as you. Somehow similar in Did He Kill Them, um, which is, again, something uh, contemporary to Hamao and set in the high society he was completely familiar with being a member of the high society. The story is basically uh, the reading of a letter of somebody who has been sentenced to death, um, a letter uh, written to his lawyer, um, so discovered by his lawyer. And the whole plot is about uh, the confession as the primary form of evidence in the Japanese legal system, which is still the case in most, in most instances in Japan, cases are closed by confession. And in particular, by the fact that when there is a confession, um, it's almost impossible to reverse it, even if it is a fake confession. Now, as we can see, uh, Hamao Shiro is very good at dealing with what uh, Dolin called the paradox of legal injustice. Um, this legal injustice was a recurring theme in pre-modern Japan. Uh, we have a lot of um, popular uh, culture products, such as theatrical plays, um, 
ghost stories, legends, kabuki pieces about the fact that the legal system under the Tokugawa was basically conceived to protect the powerful. Um, because law in pre-modern Japan was not equal for everybody. The nobility had different rules than the commoners, which is not uniquely Japanese, of course. But modernity had come. And so the fact that Hamao shows how even a modern legal system is incapable of securing justice makes him a wonderful bridge to contemporary Japan in which those features he touches upon in the late 20s, such as the importance of contentions, the vast powers given to the prosecutors, and the fact that um, in Japan still today, the conviction rate is almost 99% uh, are still critical issues. In other words, Hamao Shiro is very good at explaining how the Japanese system is extremely effective in finding a culprit for each crime, but not the culprit for that crime. Moving to the final part of my presentation, um, I would like to go a bit beyond Hamao and discuss about law and literature and the Japanese context. I know there are many fans of the law and literature movement here at Iuris Diversitas. I am a big fan myself. However, um, the, the field in itself has always some problems in going beyond the Anglo-American perspective. This is inevitable to some extent because the law and literature phenomenon was born in an Anglo-Saxon context. But it's very difficult to go behind that. And this presentation is part of a broader research heading towards that direction. Um, now, what Hamao does is an analysis of Japanese law from a Japanese perspective. He is a double insider because he's both Japanese and a lawyer. And he's for the forerunner of a movement to popularize legal themes with a Japanese perspective. If you look at Japan now, you have um, a very extensive production of popular culture about the law. TV series, movies, manga, even video games. However, to some extent, they are still affected of, by this uh, fact that legal imagination is dominated by the American model. When you tell people about a criminal trial, for example, the first image that comes to mind is the jury, the lawyer delivering uh, the closing argument to the jury, which is not what happens in, continent, in most continental systems in most instances. Um, now, we need to equip ourselves with some kind of methodology in the sense that it is possible to learn about Japanese law, both from Japanese authors and non-Japanese authors, and both from jurists and non-jurists. In the case of Hamao Shiro, we have this double insider. He's a jurist and a Japanese. In the case of John Luther Long, the person behind the Madama Butterfly, basically, he was a jurist, but non-Japanese. And his perception of the Japanese legal system is deeply flawed by the legal orientalism he's imbued with. Um, we can learn from that. We can learn how the depictions can be incorrect. Um, going to uh, contemporary examples, Murakami Haruki, the very famous Japanese novelist, um, he's Japanese, but he's not a lawyer. However, if you read uh, some of the novels, there are, for example, the description about police interrogations that are very um, revealing on how common people in Japan today perceive the law. And then you can go all the way wrong to Arthur Golden, who did more damage to Japan than the lost war and his memoirs of a geisha. He was actually sued by the geisha he interviewed uh, for the book. They settled eventually. 
he gives this very orientalistic des des description of Japan and to some extent of legal pluralism, discussing the secret rules of this secluded world of entertainers. And again, I'm not putting everything on the same level. This is a curate. This is um, Japanese. This is contemporary. And this is wrong. But we can learn something from each of them as long as we are clear about what our methodology is, about what we should be expecting from each other. Uh, those are my, my very um, inconclusive conclusions. Uh, this is just the start of uh, um, research. I'm working with a colleague um, in Sofia University in Tokyo on a book, which is the history of Japanese law through literary sources. And we try to uh, use a variety of materials from ghost stories to contemporary novels to do that. But I would like to leave the audience with a question. Um, in comparative law, we have our methodology. We have our tools. We went from institutional to functional, to law and economics, to cultural, to quantitative, to affective. We have developed a wonderful toolbox we can use to analyze comparative situations. And people in comparative literature did the same. They have close reading, distant reading. They have a number of um, methodological tools they can use to properly analyze the context. Now, my question is, how do we combine both? How can we create a truly comparative law and literature movement doing truly interdisciplinary research? Um, and with this open question, which is basically a call for arms to everybody who can be interested in this research, I thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, with the, my very Italian timekeeping, I think I was just like 20 minutes. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Grazie, Giorgio. Uh, thank you, Giorgio. Thanks for uh, your time. Uh, strictly, which uh, is much appreciated, and uh, thanks for your call to arms. Uh, it will be picked, doubtlessly. Uh, I would suggest we keep the discussion for the final part of the session, so we proceed with the next speaker and uh, ask questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much, Giorgio. It's been great. And we will talk later. Uh, I don't see Chiara Correndo. She should be with us. She's not, unfortunately. Uh, so we will proceed with the third speaker in the list, Gian Matteo Sabatino, uh, Jongnan University of Economy and the Law. Uh, Gian Matteo will present on rule of law and rule of virtue in the Asian legal traditions. Gian Matteo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Casellucci. I will share my screen so you can all see. Should be displayed correctly. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you in the first place uh, to Juris Diversitas for organizing this conference. And uh, I am from uh, the, the Sino Italian Institute of uh, the Zhongnan University of Economics and Law, as well as the University of Trento in, um, in Italy. And uh, at the Sino Italian Institute, uh, we are currently carrying out uh, several research projects concerning legal traditions uh, and the uh, history of uh, Chinese law in the first place. So maybe uh, I hope uh, you can forgive me if uh, my presentation will be mostly about the Chinese legal culture, but I felt it was, uh, it was appropriate to frame such concept, that of rule of virtue in relation to rule of law, not only with China, but also with other Asian legal traditions, because uh, this, uh, this notion, which comes from, uh, from China, uh, essentially, was uh, was spread spread throughout several parts 
of, uh, of East Asia and still today, I think, uh, affects uh, the, the development of uh, legal cultures and legal systems in other Asian jurisdictions. So therefore, in the first place, uh, uh, the problem, the fundamental issue of uh, this presentation is the relationship between the rule of law and the rule of virtue. And I would like to start from a recent decision from a Chinese court. This is a decision of November 2018, so uh, basically two and a half years ago. Uh, it, it is from a local court so a people's court in the Henan province. And the case which was discussed was about contracts. Basically, it was about a loan contract between a bank and uh, an individual, uh, a person. And at some point, uh, the, the court, uh, in order to uphold uh, the legitimacy, the validity of the loan contract, he wanted to refer to the principles, uh, to principles which we all know, uh, the principles of uh, good faith, uh, of uh, trustworthiness, uh, of uh, correctness uh, in the in, trans in economic transaction and in contractual transactions. But uh, the peculiar element of this decision is that at some point the judge makes this statement, uh, well, this is my uh, translation. It is not strictly literal, but uh, uh, it is uh, more of a free translation. But the concept expressed by the judge is that uh, uh, to uphold the principles of good faith and trustworthiness, it is uh, not only a reference to current law, to modern law, to, to contract law now, in force in China, but it is also connected on the one hand to traditional virtues of the Chinese nation, of the Chinese people, of the Chinese culture. And it is also a fundamental requirement for the governance of the country according to virtue and according to law. So basically this, this decision, in this decision, the judge puts in relation two elements, which obviously in, in his mind are connected. On the one hand, the, the rule of law. So the fact that the judge acts upon the, the law, the, the statutory law. And on the other hand, a notion of a rule of virtue, which means that uh, this kind of decision is also supported by uh, a legal culture conceiving uh, a notion of governance uh, relying on the virtues, virtue, virtues relationships, virtues uh, concept. And what does this concept mean, basically? And this is uh, our necessary starting point. Oh, sorry. Okay. What is the rule of virtue? Uh, the rule of virtue basically in, uh, in Chinese corresponds to this term, the zhe, which is uh, connected and uh, even opposed to the other concept of fa zhe, which corresponds roughly to our notion of, uh, of rule of law. Obviously it is not exactly uh, the same we could discuss uh, uh, in depth about this problem, but the fundamental relationship is about these two concepts. The concept of rule of virtue is something which is uh, embedded in, in Asian legal traditions uh, and uh, it originates uh, from the Confucian legal thought. Basically the idea of uh, governing a country by virtue stems uh, from the ritual character of uh, Confucian legal thought. So the idea that the rules to govern, to manage the relationships between the subjects within a country must stem, must stem from a set of social hierarchies, uh, of, from a set of uh, ethical principles. So the idea that uh, a relation must uh, rely 
on social hierarchies as well as on ethical principles involving mutual benefit and respect between people placed at different uh, at different uh, steps of the of the social of the social ladder but this idea it is also related to uh, a dynamic approach to legal rules which implies, uh, and here I am referring to the works of some comparative legal scholars, such as Party Glenn, for example, who highlighted how in the Asian legal traditions, not only in the Chinese, but also to some extent in the Indian legal tradition, for example, the idea of legal rules in principles, in principle refuses the abstractness and the generality of the legal norm, and it prefers a sort of case by case adjudication on the basis of broad principles connected to the ethical fiber, to the moral texture of a, of a society. And this frame, this, this mechanism framed within the concept. Of, uh, of rule of virtue, it creates a sort of uh, um, a sort of dialectical relationship with the notion of rule of law, with the notion of law, because uh, uh, you see that, for example, in the Confucian legal thought, as you probably know, in principle, the the rule of virtue uh, should prevail over the rule of law in the sense that uh, the rule of law is a sort of emergency mechanisms of uh, emergency solution, which uh, implies a sort of defect in the, um, in the proper function of the, of the, of the society, of the um, ordinary uh, legal transactions uh, according to, uh, to rituals and according to, according to virtue. And this translated into the, the modern, development of the Chinese legal system and other Asian legal systems meant a sort of double standard to evaluate the decisions of the authorities, the, the decisions of the conduct of the public officials, which causes and caused uh, several issues regarding the, the legitimacy of certain actions carried out by, pub by public officials, which were, for example, uh, which were relying on a sort of rule of virtue. And even if uh, uh, in principle, they did violate the, uh, the rule of law. And uh, uh, I want to give you an example concerning the uh, economic governance, uh, uh, an example which, uh, does not come from uh, come China, but in this case uh, from Korea, you know that uh, the Asian legal cultures, uh, uh, the Chinese legal culture, the Vietnamese legal culture, the Korean legal culture have been all uh, deeply affected by the, by the Confucian legal thought. The, the first uh, circulation of legal model of legal models, if we can speak in uh, in these terms, uh, in in East Asia occurred uh, on the basis uh, of the of the diffusion of the of the Confucian thought of the Confucian uh, principles of uh, of governance. And so we have in uh, in this country and also in Korea and in particular I'm talking about South Korea an example from. Uh, the 1960s, where basically the, the government, the Korean government, in order to carry out a plan to develop the nation, stipulated, concluded a sort of, uh, uh, it has been called uh, a developmental alliance with uh, some uh, private uh, business operators, some big private uh, establishments and companies uh, and big private industrial groups, which uh, had been convicted on grounds of uh, corruption and other economic, uh, uh, economic crimes uh, occurred in the, 
in the past uh, in the past years and basically this development uh, this developmental alliance uh, rested upon a sort of uh, uh, general forgiveness of such uh, of such crimes according to uh, to a pact which basically uh, compelled these private uh, establishments uh, to respect and comply with uh, public development policies and uh, Korea, in this case, Korean development plans in order to coordinate and direct the economic and social development of the nation. And this was an alliance based on a sort of, uh, of ethical standards which pose at the first place the, um, the problem of the development of the nation, even at the cost of overlooking the actual uh, legal positive, uh, legal uh, uh, fiber and legal texture of the Korean law at the, at the time. And so you can see how this uh, causes a problem, uh, even when we think about, for example, and here I am coming back to China, when I am talking about a double standard to evaluate public officials uh, conduct, because uh, the, the development of the Chinese legal system and Chinese law regarding the, uh, the supervision of public officials conduct always rested upon a sort of formal legal structure based, and especially in these past few years, based more and more on uh, uh, rule of law standards. So the idea to evaluate uh, the conduct of public officials on the basis of the respect of laws and regulations. But on the other end, there was also another standard of evaluation, which was more linked maybe to the political evaluation by the Chinese Communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party and uh, the legal structures of the Chinese Communist Party super disciplinary disciplinary system, which rested also upon an, an idea of uh, virtue, an idea of uh, ethical uh, and moral character of public officials, uh, which referred to the, uh, the idea of, uh, of rule of virtue. And this is also a problem because uh, one of the major problems is uh, obviously a possible conflict between the rule of law and the rule of virtue. And the other big problem is about uh, the definition of virtue, because you know, virtue is a flexible concept. It stems from the Confucian thought resting upon social hierarchies, but in concrete, which are the values which are behind this virtue? And obviously the answer is that in modern China, the Chinese Communist Party claims uh, a sort of, uh, uh, of guiding role in shaping such, uh, such, prin such principles, in shaping the content of the, uh, of the rule of virtue. And now, um, by looking at the bigger picture, we can see how, uh, I don't want to take up much time, so maybe I will be overlooking or leaving some things out. But the, um, one of the, the main uh, points to touch is about the relationship between the rule of virtue and also the development on Asian constitutionalism, especially in China, meaning not only the People's Republic of China, but also, for example, Taiwan. Because when I, I, I saw, I just, uh, the development of the Chinese legal system, I have to mention that the Chinese constitutional theory um, rests upon a sort of integration between a socialist legal culture, obviously, but also I mean, the important theories and the important thought of uh, Sun Zhongshan, which is known uh, in the West uh, as uh, Sun Yat-sen, which in China is considered still today as one of the, the founding fathers of the, of the modern Chinese nation. 
And the constitutional thought of Sun Yat-sen relied upon a five power theory um, opposed or um, just developed uh, uh, starting from the, the three power theory known in, in Western legal culture. And uh, uh, among these five powers, there was also a control of UN, uh, UN, a sort of supervisory organ, uh, a supervisory power, which has been the object of uh, an ongoing debate among uh, Chinese legal, uh, legal scholars, which basically try to connect this control UN to the idea of not only a, a legal control on the, uh, on the conduct of public organs, but also upon a moral control. And this is why I uh, talk about moral power. So a sort of uh, supervision um, in light of ethical standards to evaluate the conduct of public officials. It is interesting to see, however, how in the modern development of the, uh, of the Asian, of these two uh, Chinese legal systems, on the one hand, we have uh, in Taiwan um, a sort of activity of the control when which is more and more, especially in, re in recent years, uh, more and more approaching a Western standard of rule of law and of uh, audit control. So basically the, this control when in the, in the Taiwan uh, constitutional law is becoming more similar to a sort of uh, ombudsman, ombudsman as known in uh, the European legal system and especially the Scandinavian legal system. But on the other hand, we have in China a development of the constitutional thought, which instead is focusing more and more on the integration between uh, the rule of law and uh, the rule of virtue in supervising the conduct of public officials. With the constitutional reform on 2018, um, a supervisory commission was, was, was introduced. We, we all probably uh, know about that. And uh, then uh, a supervision law was enacted to regulate uh, the functioning of this uh, supervision commission at the general and at the local level. And article, and Article 11 of, oh, thank you, I, I, I am finishing. And Article 11 of this uh, supervision law also talks about uh, moral integrity as a criterion to evaluate, uh, to scrutinize the behavior, not only of public officials, but also of uh, everyone carrying out uh, uh, affairs of public uh, relevance. And I will skip this slide. And the main problem, the main issue, as I recalled before, is uh, uh, in particular on this point. So this codification of moral integrity, this codification of uh, the rule of virtue rests uh, upon which criteria? Who decides which are the moral standards connected? To this notion of rule of virtue. The decision of this, the Chinese court in the first slide talked about good faith and connected it to a general notion of rule of virtue. But who decides which are the virtues which may help, which may guide the judge in, uh, in the interpretation of good faith? This is obviously a hot topic because it also connects with the, uh, the relationship between the law and the party, the, the Communist Party in the Chinese legal system. But it is also, I think, a peculiar trait of the development of the, the, the Chinese legal system, especially in these past few years, which uh, uh, should be uh, taken into account also by comparative analysis at a, at a broader at a broader range from a broader perspective and uh, i want to finish here so i will stop
my sharing and I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Gian Matteo. Very, very good. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. Well. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sure we will have a fruitful discussion at the end of this session. And uh, so let's proceed. I still see that Chiara Gurrenda is not with us. So Marina Vahabava is the fourth speaker on the list. She comes from the University of Teramo. She is a PhD student and uh, a, a practicing lawyer in, uh, in, uh, in Abruzzo. She will present her paper on, uh, titled Systematic Vagrancy and Parasitism in the Soviet Criminal Code. Uh, Marina, are you there? I'm here. Yes, Good morning, I'm everyone. Good. Do you Thank hear you. me? Yes. Do you have a presentation or you just speak of yours? No, I just speak. Good. Uh, so it will be a pleasure to listen to you. Marina, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. First, I want to, uh, I would like to thank the conference organizer uh, for giving me the opportun opportunity to, to speak and participate today. A particular thanks goes to Professor Castellucci. The theme of uh, my speech is uh, uh, systematic vagrancy and parasitism in the Soviet criminal code. So, the Article 12 of the USSR Constitution or Soviet Constitution of uh, 1936 read, labor in the USSR is a duty and a matter of honor for every able citizen. Under this article, also a subsequent constitution of 1961, the presidency of the Supreme Council of the Soviet Union adopted a degree uh, on straightness the fight uh, against persons like slakers, uh, parasites, vagrancy, evading socially useful work and leading an antisocial parasitic lifestyle. And it mean uh, in, so what it mean? According to the Article 209 of uh, the Criminal Code uh, of the Soviet Union, the systematic vagrancy or badging, uh, called also parasitism, uh, established. The systematic practice of vagrancy or badging continued after the second warning made by the administrative authorities is punishable by deprivation of liberty for a term of up to two years or correctional labor for the term from six months on to one year. The article established, in fact, liability to three uh, different forms of so-called parasitic uh, existence in a Russian uh, call it uh, tuniyatsva, and the person who do it um, call it in Russian tuniyatsi. And it forming in different uh, corpus delicti, like engaged in a vagrancy, badging, leading, and a different parasitic lifestyle. The concept of another parasitic lifestyle that has been going on a long time includes those cases when a person evaded a socially useful work and lives in an, other an homes for more than four consecutive months or in general for more, more than one year. And in this connection, we receive an official warning and after, if the official warning it was not able, um, that became a criminal. At the same time, socially useful work was understood only the state work. In fact, uh, the self-employment uh, and other work were allowed only in their span in the form of a socially useful works. Otherwise, it was equally equi equated, equipped on two par parasitism. And studying in a public, uh, uh, public schools was considered also a social useful work. Uh, but the means of uh, uh, 1964, more than 37,000 of the people has been exhibited under this degree. And it is curious to notice uh, uh, how the parasites were recognized uh, and referred by the, um, for example, engineer technologies that are stopped working with the state uh, work, equipped the rabbit form and began to live up in home uh, it brought. Another case, it was 
a firefighter that uh, was engaged in his land and um, trade some vegetables and fruits. Sometimes could have decided to evict disabled people. Chests of parasitism were frequently applied to dissidents and uh, refuseniks, many of whom was intellectuals of the Soviet. In fact, many of Soviet intellectuals and dissidents were accused of the crime of parasitism, including an important Joseph Brodsky, in fact, the, the Russian poet that awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1987 was charged with the social parasitism in a so by Soviet authorities. In 1964, the court found that his series of uh, not stable job and the, um, the role, like a poet, were not a sufficient contribution to the Soviet society. So we need to understand why it was uh, in this way, why it was this uh, crime. In 1982, with the inauguration of Yuri Andropov, life as general secretary of the Central Com Commission of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the first again parties intensified. The policy periodically organized rights in shops or cinemas, cinemas during the work hours. All citizens of working age called here and were checked and reported to the place of the word about truancy. It must be said in general that for the moral and the ethical of the citizens during the Soviet period, full employment was considered the right guaranteed by the state and the form of personal and also social uh, realization. <clears throat> The right to work in the USSR was um, carried also by constitution, in particular the article of 5008 of the constitution of 1936 and also the same in the after another constitution of um, 1977 uh, in the article by 14. Every citizen in fact was guaranteed employment and in particular that is the right to receive a guaranteed job with pay in accordance with its quality and not lower when the state minimum size, including the right to choose a profession, occupation and work in accordance with uh, vocation, ability, uh, education and social needs. So by official it was mean to be employment for a company or an institution with a mandatory mark in the so-called workbook. Uh, the particular uh, that uh, this workbook was uh, very important because um, every labor are not uh, this uh, um, employment. And the best social ideal for the Soviet worker ethic, worker ethic, it was uh, considered to increase only two in the workbooks. First, about employment after uh, his graduation, and the, the last, about the dismissal of it from its connection with uh, retirement. So the uh, campaign against parasitism did not uh, give much results, and uh, after all, the criminal article less than 30 years. The, the fight against parasitism was carried out before the adoption in 1991 of the Employment Act, which abolished the criminal uh, liability for parasitism and recognized unemployment. Uh, and nowadays, according to the Article 37 of the current constitution of uh, nowadays uh, Russian Federation, uh, we have, uh, and the labor code also, the forced labor in the Russian was uh, um, pro prohibited, and the phrase about uh, guaranteed employment for the citizen uh, is absent. Mm -hmm. Another particular rule um, was foreseen in uh, this historical period, and uh, in fact, the Article 69 of the Criminal Code of uh, Soviet Union um, prescribed the sabotage. What is this? An action or inaction aimed in understanding industry, transport, agriculture, the monetary system, trade, another sector, or the national economy, 
as well as in activities of state bodies of public organization with the aim of working in the Soviet state, in this act uh, was committed by the using state or public enterprises, institution, organization or other uh, containing their normal work. And um, finally, the applicable sentence is the deprivation of liberty for the term of eight to 15 years. Uh, with con confiscation of property. Uh, the use of their people who knowingly and uh, um, most often without it, without intention, did harm uh, to everything that formed the basis of the Soviet state. Anyone who unwittingly blindly something personal gave an assessment or that has happening or accidentally broke something at work, public work, of course, immediately fell under this article. Both rules affect their behavioral content and the severity of the penalties provided for. A question comes spontaneously. Do, some, do similar law uh, belong only uh, the past? The answer is no. And I explain why. If you consider some example that follow. On 1015, the president of the Republic of Belarus, uh, stand degree number three, called it on the provision of social dependency, in which established the obligation of citizens of Belarus, permanent residents, uh, all country or foreign citizen, the senseless person who did not participate in the financing income of the public, public economy, or participate in such financing less more uh, 1,083 calendar days uh, in the past year to pay a fee uh, that represents 20 basic values. The degree did not apply to every, everyone. Certain categories, uh, such as in disabled young people under 18 uh, or personals or military, etc., uh, were excluded. However, mothers of families caring for children were excluded under certain conditions. In particular, one parent raising a child under the age of uh, seven, or disabled child under the age of 18, or uh, three or more children. In all other cases, the tax was duty. The development of the so-called paroxide tax has been suspended after process uh, in uh, several countries uh, uh, of, the, of the Belarus. And um, after the protest, the law was again sent for revision, but it uh, was not completely repleted. And uh, there are two years uh, later, in 1918, the president decided in new degree number one, uh, promotion and employment. He made significant change in the early law and literally abolished its provision. Since then, all citizens who are not employed in economy have been uh, exempt from paying tax. In addition, commission have uh, introduced and launched uh, in a country uh, different kind of helps uh, for the citizens, like uh, get a job, uh, retraining, uh, or um, uh, the, the help for temporary job. But what is happening in Europe? Are there similar cases? What happens to people who don't study, don't work in the Europe? A similar phenomenon called the need. They called need uh, in English, uh, the acronym means uh, neither in employment nor in education or training, and um, mm, that represents inactives, those who don't study, uh, don't work, and don't follow vocation training. There are mainly young people, and it is well known that there are many in uh, Mediterranean countries like in Greece, uh, Italy, Spain. Latterly, however, Italy was surpassed everyone and making a state European primacy uh, that should be an alarm uh, for Italian economy. And so um, I ask, uh, what was due? What was the response of the Italian state or other countries of the Europe of this phenomenon? Um, in Italy, we have uh, the citizenship income, also called it reddito di cittadinanza or <laughs> RDS. 
it would be um, for all Italian citizens uh, that um, uh, stay in the situation of poverty and under the uh, over the uh, the 18 years old. The poverty that um, they showed is identified in a bill and income of 718 euros four months regarding of the level of the wealth. Uh, those uh, who receive uh, this uh, income um, also um, until the state uh, also um, in return must, uh, must um, accept a job offer. In other European Union countries, we have a similar treatment for the point of view of the minimum tenth, uh, threshold. In Italy, but in Italy, would be the only country that the guaranteed incomes uh, would be equal to the poverty line. If we do the comparison with other important countries of the European Union, some countries guaranteed much lower income than in, in Italy, Italian one. For example, in the France, we have uh, uh, guaranteed 530. In Germ Germany, about uh, 400. Uh, in the uh, United Kingdom, um, less than 400. But also has, represent, uh, has this situation um, uh, and the relative generosity we, we could call not uh, only significant a cost and a consequence for public finance, but also have important consequences on labor supply. In fact, the risk, the important risk of a person training inactive and increase that the income received by the person in the absence of work increase uh, can generate uh, black labor and other situations. Another curious example is uh, um, we have in Finland. Uh, in fact, curious experiment was to do uh, some years ago. Uh, the Social Insurance Institute of the Finland has announced that the result of the provision for uh, uh, 24 months of an unconditional universal minimum income to the group of 2,000 citizens, a guaranteed salary of 560 euros or by month, in which you can benefit without spending constants and without uh, um, the necessary of obligation to take a job, and maintained even if during the period a job was fine. Compared to another group of people who receive a normal normal and employment benefits. The result was very curiously because unemployment of this group has remained at the same level as that the control group uh, in, in fact of employment. So the aim of the experience was to examine their, the different mode to economic support affected people behavior and they are willing to find an employment. So in conclusion, what I want to say I would like to say that often the very strange and bizarre rules uh, uh, apparently have uh, a certain logic if they are considered and analyzed in historical, cultural and social context in which they were introduced. So in the case of the crime of vagrancy of parasitism of the Soviet criminal code, um, we have to consider it that uh, in the Soviet period the reason was the ideological principle according in which every citizen found full realization, personal and also social realization at the work, and the state guaranteed a full employment. In this clear that uh, any rule can be uh, misused uh, in particular way, but have seen that historical and social evolution has led to, to the emergence of the different welfare, welfare model, and both of ex-post ex uh, Soviet uh, countries, but also in the uh, European Union countries. So I think to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Very good. Uh, very interesting. And uh, we have about 25 minutes for discussion. Let's, uh, I try to summarize what, what we heard. Uh, certainly in uh, non-Western law, a lot of context uh, enters in the journey between the book and the action of the law. 
Giorgio suggests we need a methodology to develop law and literature research in on Western countries. And probably one interesting uh, idea, which we already do instinctively, is to research in the literature of those non-Western countries, the contextual element which plays along the law between the book and the action. Because uh, this is more or less what happens. Uh, in, in the Japanese note, novels from Hama Oshiro, we learn that uh, the law is considered as part of a societal game somehow. So this literature, this non-technical literature could give us hints of what important elements interplay with the norms, legal norms, and how they do that. In China, we, we heard from Gian Matteo basically that, to put it simply, there are at least two large uh, normative system of societal governance. One is the legal one and the other one is the virtue-based one, which can be traditional, political, Confucian, religious, customary, you name it. And I use uh, the novels from Chu Xiaolong when I teach Chinese law. And it's also very interesting there. And in that case, you see what Jean Matteo said, because all the operators in the system, they work according to their different rules. Nobody really violates any law from their point of view. The policeman and the party officer, they behave differently. So in that novel, you never hear any uh, technicality, any legal discussion in court. The court is at the end of the story. It never, you never hear, you never read any lawyer appearing on the scene in Chinese legal novels. It's just the interplay between the party and the administration and the police. Uh, so clearly there you see that uh, the important contextual element is this uh, game between different normative systems. Uh, in, in US uh, literature, uh, legal novels, you see that all the focus is on court proceedings, evidence taking, most notably, those dramatic uh, cross-examination you, you see in, in, in the movies as well. And normally, if there is not much context getting in the, in the law. It's just how good is the lawyer to extract a confession? Japanese confession is interesting because you go inside the mind of the person providing the confession. So it's, it's a different approach. Uh, probably a research on non-Western law and literature could be based on identifying the different contextual elements which play a significant role. I don't, I'm not familiar with uh, Russian language uh, law and literature, police novels, but Marina, you might find something uh, to develop a large non-Western law and literature project. And uh, probably you see there that there is a lot of criminal uh, tools used to implement the virtue, so to speak. And that would be very interesting to, 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 to to research in, in the people's perception. Do we have Soviet era legal novels? What are they about? That would be interesting to develop a project on non-Western legal literature. I leave it there to you for, for discussion. Please speak one at a time, raise hands or uh, write an, a line in the chat so I can give the microphone to whoever wants to intervene. including the speakers, of course. Uh, yes, Pasquale. Pasquale Viola wants to intervene. Yes, uh, you can unmute. Everybody else should mute, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much. A really interesting panel. And I have just a few questions for, for uh, Giorgio Colombo and for Gian Matteo Sabatini. Uh, for um, Giorgio Colombo, uh, about the recurring theme, of the Shiro's um, uh, novels and narratives, the inability of the legal system to deliver justice. So this inability, was this inability ground on ethics 
or fails of techni technicalities or, or, or both. And then uh, what, what, what was his idea of justice? And there was at the time in Japan a, a sort of common idea or common sense of justice. And uh, always, uh, again, regarding Shiro's critique, uh, uh, did emerge justice and litigation fallacies uh, under his critical approach. And so he did he divide um, justice from litigation. And then uh, whether or if he uh, adhered or, or not, or, or shared um, some specific um, criminal law scholarship or continental European uh, specific criminal law scholarships. And for Giammatteo Sabatini, uh, just one fast question. Uh, so what was the impact of Buddhism in shaping rule by virtue, virtue um, grounded, of, uh, grounded of course on Confucianism, but in Southeast Asia, not in China, of course. Okay, you can answer in the same order. And then thank you. the next question will come from Agustin Parise. Um, first of all, thank you for your question. Um, what is particularly remarkable in the work of Hamao Shiro is that he perfectly knows the inner working of Japanese criminal procedure because he was a prosecutor. And so he is really merciless in showing how from a technical point of view, there are so many weak points that can be exploited. Um, it, it's really fascinating to see that because um, this positivist idea of the legal system as the tool to deliver justice uh, was somehow rhetorically presented to the Japanese people at the time. But we were already, uh, uh, unfortunately, shifting toward nationalism and uh, uh, eventually to the militarism that led to World War II. And the idea of law was already being corrupted, was already being used instrumentally. So he basically puts himself in this transaction and this transition. So um, yes, um, he mostly focusing on trial um, because this is what was, is, main interest. Um, so it doesn't consider like the legal system as a whole. Um, as for your final question, um, the Japanese, Japanese legal scholars are among the best comparative lawyers in the world because, because of this um, continental influence on the Japanese legal system. Every professor of criminal law is supposed to read German and to refer to German legal scholarship. Or if it is different philosophy, Fran, France and French legal scholarship, or both. So it was it was already it was an early phase of development. So I cannot specifically point to the theories of any scholar in particular, but the continental influence was extremely strong indeed. Thank you for your questions. Well, I commit myself, uh, but thank you for your question. Well, about the impact of Buddhism, um, well, um, if we think about rule of virtue as a concept, so the theorization of uh, rule of virtue is specifically uh, Confucian. So um, we uh, do not have uh, a, a parallel uh, theorization of uh, a doctrine of governance in uh, um, in the Buddhist in the Buddhist thought, uh, at least in China, uh, well, obviously we can, from a comparative perspective, uh, trace uh, some uh, parallels uh, or develop some uh, some reasoning, especially if we think uh, that uh, Buddhism as Confucianism, uh, well, um, conceives uh, the relationship. Uh, between the law and the ethics, uh, so the and even the, the moral character of uh, uh, of the conduct of the of the rule and of the governance in uh, in a different way from obviously the paradigm of, of Western rule of law, we can certainly state that this uh, cultural background um, promoted fostered. Uh, um, a, con a concept uh, and uh, a conception of uh, 
of legal rule and of ethical rule, not only in China, but also, for example, I think about, uh, I think about Vietnam, uh, which uh, is, uh, is near the, the, paradigm, the paradigm of, uh, of the rule of virtue in the, um, in, in the Chinese legal culture. I think that the, the real element of, uh, uh, so to say, polarization uh, and the real element which, uh, especially in the past few decades, uh, uh, favored the, the revival of the rule of virtue as a general uh, concept of governance in certain Asian jurisdiction is the is socialist law. And basically the way socialist law after the beginning of the reforms, so basically starting from the 1980s in China, in Vietnam, in Laos, uh, uh, tried to uh, integrate within its logical structure uh, uh, certain general values which uh, were already embedded in the, in the culture uh, of, uh, of those legal system and which certainly uh, in some cases were more linked to the, uh, to the Confucian legal thought uh, and in other uh, selected jurisdiction could be more linked to the uh, Buddhism uh, legal thought and uh, Buddhist thought about uh, the relationship between law and, and ethics. Uh, from, an, from an historical perspective, however, we must also consider that the relationship between uh, Confucianism and Buddhism was not always simple, uh, and uh, in some cases uh, it was uh, also complicated. Uh, and uh, for example, in China, the, there was uh, in some periods uh, a constant tension between uh, um, Confucian schools, so the Confucian thought, uh, and the uh, and the Buddhist thought. So, uh, so uh, certainly, this should be a point deserving uh, further research, especially from um, a historical perspective. And I hope to have answered at least a little bit to your question. Thank you very much. Yes. Before giving the microphone to Agustin, I uh, just want to add a comment on Buddhist law. Uh, traditionally and paradoxically, perhaps, Buddhism introduced an element of more legality in the legal systems of South, Southeast Asia. For instance, compared with the Hindu law where, where the virtue was uh, paramount in the activity of governance. Uh, Buddhist kings were more bound to the law than Hindu kings. So the virtue element was diminished in a sense. Uh, with respect to other southern traditions of Asia, it, it, where the Buddhist element became uh, an element of flexibility was at granular level, for instance, introducing in, in judgments a karmic element to provide leniency, which is much more connected to a cosmic uh, vision, cosmovision and cosmic vision of the law than to the actual virtuous behavior of that particular person. So certainly the relation is very complex and, and should deserve a conference in itself. Um, Agustin Parise. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio. And, and my question is for Giorgio Colombo. Uh, Giorgio, when, when you were speaking I, about law and literature, I was immediately thinking of John Wigmore the American jurist, uh, that he was visiting in Japan at the time when uh, uh, Shiro was born, at the, almost the same time. And uh, Wigmore developed his list of 100 novels and the law and literature movement. So I was wondering if in your work, did you encounter any connection between Shiro and Wigmore maybe? Was there any dialogue or maybe not? Or maybe have you found other studies that explore the, let's say, the uh, US presence through Wigmer and the law and literature movement into Japan. So it's an invitation rather than a question, an invitation for you to further develop on that side. Thank you, Giorgio. Thank you, I appreciate your input a lot. Um, there is a paper by a famous Japanese law scholar about Wigmer and called like Wigmer's treasure box. 
because we 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 still haven't fully opened the chest. Uh, Wigmore was so uh, incredibly prolific in his production, and his collection of original Japanese legal documents is still fundamental for the study of Japanese law. I haven't seen any direct encounter between the two, but I appreciate very much your input, and I will definitely follow your suggestion to, to look for that. Okay, any other question or comments? I see Giorgio. See? Is it okay? Oh, I think it is. It is I, I have a right, a, a hand up from uh, Salvatore. Hmm. Salvatore. I believe that Giorgio wants to make a question first. And uh, isn't it? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah if possible, but. Go yeah. ahead. I was already no, spoke enough. You raise the hand first, and then I will. Okay, no problem. Okay, so uh, a quick question. I know that is a broad question, but to both Gian Matteo and Marina, uh, specifically starting on a point that Gian Matteo raised. Um, when I read in both like Japanese and Chinese judgments or legal scholarship uh, references to the millenary traditional values, I can't help myself but thinking about self-orientalism. And these jack of all trades to use like the old ways and beautiful customs to basically decide whatever is convenient to whoever runs the show. Is this was the same in nationalist Japan. Now in Japan, the far right wants to put the millennial tradition of Japan in the constitution. And I think it was somehow the same in the Soviet Union, uh, this uh, reference to the socialist virtues and work as a fundamental activity. So my question to both of you is like, considering this from a technical, serious, legal point of view, how much do you think there is a, a legitimate point and how much you think is window dressing and the rhetorics in making these assertions? I know it's a very broad question, sorry about that. Can I, can I start? Sure. Just, uh, well, obviously the reference to uh, legal traditions and uh, uh, old values uh, of, uh, of the Chinese culture is a, a strong political tool. This is a, uh, this is certainly um, a valid point. Uh, what I think it is interesting is how such a reference uh, developed, uh, especially in the in the past few decades, uh, because we see that um, with regard to uh, to China, for example, that the the revival of uh, these uh, these old values was a gradual process, uh, especially starting from the reforms. Uh, which, however, up to uh, a few years ago, was not actually embraced by, by courts. Uh, actually, the, the specific reference uh, to uh, concepts uh, such as the rule of virtue or uh, um, moral values related, specifically related to, to, the Chinese, uh, to the Chinese legal culture has been for uh, uh, some decades uh, a sort of uh, parallel uh, format uh, or a sort of deep format of, uh, of the Chinese legal system, which in most cases uh, uh, was not uh, visible uh, on the surface, uh, meaning that obviously it was embedded in the, in the cultural and political structure of, uh, uh, of the Chinese legal system. But uh, in some cases, uh, um, statutes, uh, or uh, even the, the major, uh, uh, some major decision of, uh, of Chinese court uh, um, did not specifically mention uh, these uh, sets of, uh, of values and uh, well, tried to abide to a sort of uh, uh, Western rule of law language, especially in the, uh, in the 90s, uh, where there was a sort of enthusiasm about uh, the introduction of, uh, of Western rule of law 
in, uh, um, in China. Well, what this is, what this is uh, interesting to know is that especially in the, in the recent years and especially with the, the, the leadership of uh, Xi Jinping, and this is a point which, for example, was also underlined, I think, by uh, Professor Cavalieri, Renzo Cavalieri, in, in some discussions, is that uh, these values, uh, these uh, references uh, are increasingly being codified as positive law in the Chinese legal system. So for example, we have uh, the supervision law, which uh, uh, explicitly talks about uh, moral standards and ethical standards related to, to moral integrity. And uh, uh, this is obviously just, uh, just an example, but a few years ago, we, uh, we had uh, a period where the, where the socialist core values, uh, which were heralded uh, as a guiding, a set of guiding principles for the interpretation of Chinese law, then uh, their important, importance gradually diminished in, uh, in the past few years. But we still had some, some courts uh, um, related, uh, which uh, were expressed, uh, referred to, uh, to such values. Well, the, the focal point uh, is that uh, this reference, which is, I repeat, increasingly being codified, uh, um, is obviously a, a sort of, uh, uh, well, a backdoor uh, through which uh, the, the political will of the, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to um, affirm itself in the development of the legal system. Because, well, obviously, from a constitutional point of view, since the Chinese Communist Party is the guiding party in China, it has the legitimacy to interpret these, these broad concepts related to the, the governance of, uh, of the Chinese country. And so, John this Matteo, integration- make it short because uh, Marina also has to answer. So, oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, basically yeah, I okay. can, I think I raised my point. I, so it's, it's okay. Here I am. I thank uh, Giorgio for the question because uh, he gave me possibility to explain my point of view. I'm I'm sure, uh, like Gian Matteo and uh, also like Giorgio, I think that uh, the law and uh, rules of um, Soviet period uh, uh, are also um, can be considered uh, in a cultural period, uh, um, historical period particular. And um, um, in fact, it considered the law and rules of the social um, uh, period considered autonomous model of uh, uh, law, like uh, civil law, um, uh, um, common law, and others. Also, uh, that, that don't exist in this period because it appertains of the central period, uh, historical period, but it also consider autonomy family. So, uh, and in fact, uh, now I stood studying a different uh, um, legislation of post Soviet countries like Russian Federation. Ukrainian, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Belarus, and other. All of these uh, th that countries uh, take uh, a different model um, of uh, USA law, model law of the USA, European countries. But we have one line that um, um, exists uh, also in the modernity in this period. It is a consideration of high ethical, moral consideration, um, some cultural consideration that for um, different studies maybe can consider it like some rhetorical aspect, some political aspect, but it is not so for the person who studied it in in more deeper uh, deeper consideration. In fact, I accept uh, the invite of professor to consider it some novels of the Soviet period and they consider the point of view of uh, people, uh, not liar, so of that period in the, the way that um, they consider the applicable law. 
uh, I think about a different um, poem, poem and novels more famous uh, also in Occident, uh, like uh, um, Dostoevsky and uh, Crime and Punishment. Also, uh, Bulgakov that consider Maestro and Margarita um, represent very good uh, uh, in the different uh, curious aspect of the Soviet period and lifestyle of that period. Uh, we have also another poem like Dead Souls of uh, um, Gogol and other. So I, I take uh, the invite and I hope it will be possible to collaborate uh, all together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more uh, comment from Salvatore before we close session. Uh, yes, uh, this is just a, a, just a comment, uh, not really a question, uh, as Giorgio has launched this call for arms. So uh, I actually, uh, I mean, would be interested in, in exploring the way how to answer to his call of arms, because I see uh, I mean, I'm going a little bit out of the of the topic, but I see a lot of potentialities about law and literature uh, uh, with reference to African uh, legal systems, considering that, uh, uh, especially with reference to unofficial law, uh, informal laws, everything is uh, can be drawn from from the literature. Uh, and when I'm saying literature, I'm referring not only to novels, but also to poems, brocards. But on the other side, there is an unwritten uh, literature uh, that should also be explored. And there most likely the, uh, the methodology on how to, uh, let's say, work on non-written literature uh, should, be, should be developed or should be understood. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know, actually, frankly speaking, if there is any law and literature uh, uh, scholarship with reference to Africa, but I, I, I would definitely uh, be interested in, in this. And maybe if you launch something uh, on a comparative perspective, uh, that would, I, would be, I would gladly be part of it. Thanks. Well, uh, as, as the Vice President of Euros Diversitas in charge of projects, uh, we could launch a research project here and now on this topic. If there is a consensus, we can exchange uh, a couple of emails later on at the end of the conference, get together sometime soon, perhaps, and discuss how to develop this. It's most interesting, I think. And of course, whoever uh, is interested may just drop me a line, send an email to um, Giorgio, to the, feel free to interact as informally and easily as you can. Uh, I see time is up and there is no other questions to be asked or comment from the audience. So I, I, well, let me say that the, the conference started the best possible way. The session has been great, very interesting, very lively. I thank our distinguished speakers and I thank you all for being present and interacting with them. Thank you very much and see you in the next sessions of this conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just thank you. one, just one uh, very quick um just one very quick uh, uh, remark uh, we have a pause and next sessions will start at 4 p.m um so you have time for uh, lunch and for doing things and we can uh, let's say uh, see again at four o'clock in the uh, we have two parallel sessions and uh, two more at 6 p.m Thank you very much and bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye.